We have a high, highly accomplished team of panelists here, and thanks to Gopal for organizing it. He's our co-chair. Uh, so let me, I'll just take a couple of minutes for all those who are new for the first time here at Thai to uh, tell you briefly about Thai organization. Um, a lot of you might have heard it before from me or our executive director, um, Raj Desai, who couldn't be here today. So, <clears throat> Thai was founded in 1992 uh, by a group of um, uh, professionals and entrepreneurs who, were, uh, very, who had become very successful here and came from a uh, South Asian region. That's why the name Indus Entrepreneur um, you know, for people coming from that side. And since 1992, now uh, it has grown to over 60 chapters worldwide and then uh, in about, um, I believe, 16 to 17 countries. So can you guys please stop talking over there? Since, since I have to talk. <laughs> so anyway, um, so especially Sison and his team over there. <laughs> Sison was past executive director of charter members, so... Still, you won't get that privilege right now while I'm talking. <laughs> so, Thai, so since its launch, I mean, Thai is a very heavily volunteer-led organization, including myself, Gopal, all our panelists, all of them. You know, they have uh, volunteered to come here and share their wisdom and insight from their hectic uh, jobs and schedule. So, really appreciate that. And as I said, Thai's mission is to foster entrepreneurship, as you can see here, and that's what we have been doing since its inception in 1992. And um, it, it, because we believe that, uh, that by cultivating and nurturing the ecosystem of entrepreneurship, uh, that's the instrument for creating prosperity you know, across the world. And today we have chapters all over the world, almost even places uh, like in Sweden, to all the way in Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, Japan. Most recently we opened chapters in um, Israel and in uh, Portugal, uh, I think Spain also. So, and in North America we have in Canada as well as in US in all the major cities. And uh, it's like I said, it's run, this whole staff here, the organization run with only a very small staff of about four people and rest are volunteers. What we do is mainly organize uh, programs and uh, anything which can help foster entrepreneurship. So key, one of the key and the main flagship program is TyCon, which is held every year in May, and we have been holding it since 1994. How many of you have been to uh, TyCon? Okay, great. So if you haven't been, so please uh, look out for it. It's held in the second week of May and next year, and you must come to that. Uh, program. It's a two-day event. It's it's very electrifying. It's like a boot camp for entrepreneurs where you have a lot of venture capitalists, industry analysts. You know, you can meet um, you know customers, advisors, mentors, etc. And not only that, last year um, by Worth Magazine, Tycon was recognized as one of the top ten conferences in the world for ideas and entrepreneurship, along with um, World Economic Forum and TED which was really a great accomplishment because TyCon is heavily organized by volunteers. They start working uh, in organizing it like in December for the next year. So about four to 500 volunteers. So I think it's a great uh, accomplishment for all the volunteers who work hard for that. And then other programs are around industry specific sectors like we have energy, this one. And these are all led by two co-chairs, and we obviously ask volunteers like Gopal, he's a vice president at SunPower, and he's another co-chair is Armando Pocker. He couldn't be here because he's based out of Chicago. He's, a, um, he's with Apex Venture Partners, and they focus on energy and IT investment. So he also comes all the way from there to hold, uh, you know, organize these programs for Thai. So, and then similarly, we have uh, social media, mobile, and then life science, uh, social media, mobile and life sciences, those are other industry specific. Basically any anything which is going on in the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem where the investments are going, there are opportunities and we also try to make sure we uh, try to bring, uh, you know, organized programs around that by having, you know, experts and panelists around the year. And then some other specific programs we have are like uh, Thai Women's Forum, and we just had recently an event about the women entrepreneurs who have been successful. Then we have Growth Company Forum. We had one event yesterday on the M&A um, in, um, 
in uh, conjunction with my Morrison Enforcer, which is one of our sponsors. So, so these are some of the programs around, um, like as you can think about about the industry trends and uh, also heavily for you guys to network. Then there are some uh, new programs we launched a couple of years ago. One was Thai Angels, which is again a platform for a lot of some of you who are uh, doing your startups or looking for seed money. You can apply for that. Anyone looking for seed money? Well, you've got a few VCs here, so you can grab them before they leave. Don't let them go. <laughs> so anyway, but we have Thai Angels if you're looking for a small amount. So uh, you, there is a, you can go to thaisv.org website, and it's a three-step process. Simply apply there with one exact summary or whatever information you can share. And then after that, if you're um, usually about 30, 40 companies apply, and it's been going on for the last two years, and on an average, one company has been funded. Um, so out of 30, eight are selected, they, um, they come and present in front of a screening committee which consists of again successful entrepreneurs and uh, VCs or past you know, angel investors. So then from there they select three and third Monday of every month then they come and present in front of um, angel investors and mostly we have about anywhere from 50 to 100 angel investors who show up and if there is a huge interest then they lead us and then use the process of someone, and they'll organize a due diligence and go on from there. That's Thai Angels. Second program we launched was, again, Pitch Fest, which is, we, we hold it almost once a month and we just started holding it in San Francisco also. So in that, again, three or four VCs are invited and randomly picked eight or nine folks. They can come and present, uh, give an elevator pitch, and then they get a instant feedback, and one of them who they select and go directly in front of Thai Angels. That's the second one. Third one, again, another new program I launched recently. This is again, as you can see, these are towards providing some funding support uh, for the entrepreneurs. The third one is a VC 101 series. I just launched in July. With, I brought two co-chairs. One is with Omidyar Investments, Raj, and another um, co-chair is Kamal, who is a senior VP at Miro. So there, what we do is again similar to, uh, basically, companies will ap apply with an exact summary, and then we um, and the co-chairs picked about eight companies, so we asked the VC to come and spend two and a half hours. Mostly we have it here and they can get a one-to-one -one meeting. And it's very, there are guidelines that they have to give a pitch as if they are presenting to a VC firm. So they can get feedback and if VC likes, you know, the entrepreneur, they can go to the next step. There is one coming actually next week from one of the Excel India partners, so which is for if any of your friends who are looking for money, they you know, they can apply for that. Um, so Excel India also invests in cross-border as well as, it's a smaller fund than the main Excel fund, so about, I think, 200 million or so. So that's the third program. And then a new program, another program I, I personally launched and I'm still chairing that is called My Story since last year in March, which is I bring um, one entrepreneur who has sold a company of like value 100 million or more in last 18 months. So like we have one coming on, um, uh, November, which is Mark Schreckler, he was CEO of uh, Amovi, which was bought by Singtel for about 300 plus million, a um, mobile advertising company. Then in December, I have Kaviam, founder and CEO, Sayed is going to be here. He built his company, you know, it's a chip company, about a couple of billion in market cap, right from zero to almost taking it public and running it very successfully, so he'll be here. So that's, that program is held first Tuesday of every month. So these are some of the new programs we have launched and we continue to look at. Uh, you know, launching again around the theme of fostering entrepreneurship. Now, uh, what in Thai basically we have four constituencies. One is our charter members. How many charter members do we have here? Can I see some hands? Okay, great. So charter members are these are highly successful uh, professionals and uh, you know entrepreneurs who are uh, invite on an invited basis. They are um, uh, you know brought in, and then uh, they you know you should connect with them. Could be your, you know, investors, angel investors, mentors, and advisors. And then second group is members. Membership is open to everyone. In fact, there's a great deal going on right now. For 100 bucks, you become a member, and everything is free this year. <laughs> so for members like these events this year, so it's only 30 cents a day. So make sure you can become members, then you can hear all this great uh, wisdom from all our uh, panelists and our wonderful programs we have here. And then third constituency is our sponsors. Like we have, uh, in fact, one of the sponsors, IBM, is in the panel, um, and you have SAP, Microsoft, law firms, VC firms, number of them, so they support financially because that's how we run the organization. Last and not, but not the least are volunteers, so 
uh, thanks to all the volunteers. Um, so with that, what I would like to do is I'd like to introduce our co-chair Gopal. As I said, uh, thanks to Gopal for spending time from his hectic schedule. He's, coach, he's been co-chair since last year and he and Armando, they've organized a lot of uh, very good uh, programs and panels in the energy sector. So with that, let's give him a big round of applause and I you know, give this to Thank you, Naveen. Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up on Wednesday evening, midweek evening, and uh, it's glad to see a lot of people who are interested in this event. Uh, before I do anything, I so before I start this program, I really would like to request uh, our panelists to talk about themselves, about what they do, and about their company, so that we know them well. And I'm your host for the next couple of hours, and then I'll talk about myself, starting with the. It's on. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pratik Chakravarti. I'm uh, the VP uh, Business Development of Bijli. Uh, Bijli is a cloud-based energy analytics company which uh, offers a home energy platform. And our, our mission is twofold. Uh, we are here to help utilities realize the untapped potential in residential energy efficiency. If you look at all the programs available today, uh, most of them realize about 1% to 2%. The potential is much bigger than that. And secondly, uh, make it easy for consumers, residential consumers, to take control of their spend without causing any discomfort. So how do we do it? We do it by... Uh, itemizing your bill. Something which is really common in most other services you have. Think about telecom, think about credit cards. But your utility bills are not itemized today. So we use our patented technology and uh, cloud-based machine learning algorithms on smart meter data to itemize your bill and generate a plans level insights into your consumption. And we use these insights to develop applications which make it much easier for you as a consumer to understand how you're spending energy where you are spending and when you are spending. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeremy Johnson. I'm the Director of Product Management for Services at Silver Spring Networks. Um, I've been a networking professional for about 15 years. I am an entrepreneur myself. I started a company um, back in 1999 um, <coughs> called NetVMG in the uh, intelligent routing space and uh, we sold that company to Internap in 2003. Since then, I've, uh, I've been with Silver Spring um, and uh, doing primarily services. Uh, for those of you that don't know Silver Spring, Silver Spring is a, a smart, grid, um, smart grid network technology company. Um, we've been around for about 10 years. Um, our primary products are uh, software services and infrastructure um, devices that uh, <clears throat> used to, to network uh, utilities on, all the way from a data center down to the meter on your house. Um, <clears throat> what uh, Silver Spring now today has about 25 million meters under contract and about 12 and a half million meters on the ground. Um, we, I believe we have the most, uh, the most meters deployed in the world. Uh, we are a global company. We've got deployments in Australia, in California, in Brazil, and we've got some in Europe as well. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Victor Westerland, and I'm a partner with Rockport Capital, so one of the two venture funds here on the panel. Rockport is about a 12-year-old fund that got started really by <coughs> two founders who came out of the energy sector. So our focus from the beginning has been on energy originally both renewable and traditional energy. Over time, we've, we've made uh, quite a few investments uh, and broadened from energy to what is commonly known as clean tech. So we have investments across solar, wind, electric vehicles and transportation, uh, green buildings, energy efficiency, really across the whole gamut of clean tech. And, and having been around before clean tech was even a term, and then when clean tech became a term, and then now that it's a bit out of favor, we have a unique perspective across kind of the, the ebbs and flows of, of, that, of that sector, but remain uh, committed to 
areas of energy sustainability and mobility broadly. Hi, I'm Ramesh Venugopal. I uh, am a member of the investment team at Vantage Point, so the second VC on the panel here. Uh, our firm uh, is, uh, has about $4 billion of assets under management, and we invest in both IT and in energy innovation. On the IT side, my focus is on enterprise, and I focus on almost all aspects of energy innovation. And uh, as does Victor's firm, we are invested uh, in all aspects of energy innovation, going from generation all the way to communications, uh, uh, and um, even into the fuel space and in the industrial chemical space. So we span the whole whole range out there. Uh, we are uh, global in our footprint. We have companies uh, in China. We have companies in the UK. We have companies in the US that we uh, that are on our portfolio. And we also have offices uh, in Europe, in the US, and in uh, China as well. Uh, two things that differentiate um, a vantage point from several other VCs is we make few investments, uh, uh, but uh, we stick with the investments for the long term because that's what is needed to uh, succeed in the energy space. It takes a while to get these companies up and running. And uh, we also uh, focus a lot on cultivating strategic partners with large corporations. And uh, just as examples, we have companies such as GE, such as ABP, such as PNG co invest with us. Uh, we, we really believe that uh, uh, this is a differentiator for us because it helps our startups uh, hit the ground running in terms of vetting their products, in terms of leveraging uh, the channels that the big companies have. And what it does for the big companies is it gives them access to emerging technologies that may fit with their, uh, the long-term vision of their business units. And finally, uh, for the entrepreneurs, unfortunately, we are at a stage right now where we are focusing on growth equity deals. So we are not doing really early stage deals right now. We used to be stage agnostic, <coughs> uh, given the nature of our fund. And uh, as uh, Victor mentioned, the state of the industry, we are uh, focusing on growth equity in energy innovation. Uh, my name is Elsa Chan, co-founder and CEO of JetLum. We are an energy management solution provider. We mainly help utilities uh, connect smart meter to devices to the home, which is, we take what Silver Spring does where they stop and we extend that reach into the home and provide uh, software and customer engagement software to the customer to uh, allow them to see how they're spending their energy and we will provide software and hardware to achieve that. Um, and so we kind of have a unique play in terms of offering utilities to connectivity to the customer as well as providing solu solutions that help customers and consumers understand how they're using their energy and then giving them the tools so they can actually do something about it, like turning off certain things or scheduling and policy-based control. My name is Steve Beyer. I'm with IBM Software Group here in Silicon Valley. I represent the big data portion of the business. Um, that plays directly into IBM's Smarter Planet um, strategy that you've probably seen on television ads and um, uh, magazines, etc. Um, there's six strategic initiatives that Software Group has at this point. Big Data is one of those six, so it's being driven literally from the top down. Um, I'll talk about some of the work we're doing with um, some energy and utility um, com or customers of ours, as well as our work in smarter cities and a few other areas. Um, on a personal note, I've uh, started some uh, <coughs> products internally inside of IBM is essentially a corporate entrepreneur. So I've dealt with a lot of the uh, ground up organically grown issues myself, um, but inside the belly of the beast, if you will, with IBM. So uh, happy to talk about that as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, folks. This is, this is an excellent panel. This is so diverse. We have two VCs, we have two startup companies, a mid-sized company, and a large company. Please give them a round of applause, and thank you. Thank you very much for coming over here and sharing your wisdom with us. So let me talk about myself. My name is Gopal Durg. I'm your host for the next hour and a half. And uh, I work for SunPower. Uh, you know, all, all solar panels, they have photons, and the photons are converted to electrons. So I don't work with photons. I work with electrons. Once they hand over photons to me, I convert them into electricity. Now, when we talk about why, why was I interested in this, panel and this topic today. 
when I work with electrons, there's always some firmware and some hardware. And when there is a firmware, there is a software. And when there is a software, there is data. And when there is data, there are services. And I think what is happening in the industry today is the, the whole industry is becoming more and more energy conscious. This is one of the pictures on the right hand side I took when I was traveling in Germany. And this building has walls made out of solar panels, glass walls, and generating megawatts of data on every hourly basis. And I think it might not be a bad scenario when we have the suffix changing from I to S being smart energy. And this year, for the last year, I would say this industry was around a billion dollar. It's going to become six times to almost like a six billion dollars in the next couple of years. But this is a growing industry with 85% of this uh, data, this revenue will be coming in from software services. So, given that, I take a little bit more into this. There are approximately 1.8 zettabytes of data being generated every year which will grow four times, so eight zettabytes of data, which is almost like 200 billion high-definition movies. That's the amount of data that we generate. And in that, in UK alone, the 28 million meters, just electric meters, not even water meters or anything, just electric meters, they do 2.5 trillion measurements a year. That's the kind of data we are generating. I think we should be interested in knowing from our panelists how much of data is going to be impacting us, how much of data are we going to be generating, and how will this affect us in the smart homes, smart energy, clean energy, how is that going to be affecting our life? I think I would like to start with you. Yeah, just to give you an idea of the volume of data we are looking at in energy, uh, a smart meter today generates about 100 megabytes worth of data per year. So that's one home. So if you're talking about millions of homes, hundreds of millions of homes, you can easily get into the terabytes and petabytes of data. It's massive. The other thing that's happening is uh, utilities who are installing these smart meters, they really do not have the DNA to mine this data. They do not have the expertise. And they are struggling with it. So the industry needs a robust solution to help them do that. I'm going to throw two words at you. Um, apologies, I'm leveraging my background with the utilities here. Two words you might have heard and you would definitely have heard if you've interacted with utilities. That's energy efficiency and demand response. Energy efficiency means reducing consumption. Demand response means reducing peak load so that you don't have to build more power plants. Utilities are mandated to do this, depending on which geography you are in. The challenge is how can you use this data to do it in a way which is operationally efficient and more importantly, you do not cause any discomfort to your consumers. Let's look at these. Uh, number one, uh, we all talk about energy security, correct? Uh, we are lucky to live in a time over the past few years when the natural gas prices have been low, thanks to the shale gas pool. Prices will come up. Natural gas is a commodity. The demand drivers will increase once we start exporting natural gas. The prices are bound to go up. Coal is not clean. There is a big push against it from all the environmentalists. So your price of electricity is going to go up. What is the cheapest source of electricity today? It's energy efficiency. It costs less than even coal. And utilities have to incorporate that in their portfolio. Let's look at another thing, your environmental impact. <coughs> if, if every home in the U.S. saves $50 a year, it's nothing, $50 a year, you can cut down CO2, which would be equivalent of taking 25 million cars off the road. Granted, not all utilities are totally pro-green energy, but they cannot ignore the facts. And the way to do it is demand response. If you and I can reduce the peak consumption in our home, we would obviate the need for building expensive power plants. And by power plants, we mean natural gas power plants, coal-based power plants. So how can we use data to enable utilities, target consumers to get this peak reduction? And number three, 
more from a consumer point of view is lifestyle. Granted, yeah, I'm happy to help utilities to cut down energy consumption, but I do not want to cause any discomfort in my life. Saving 50 bucks may not be a big deal for me per year, but why would I do it? What's in it for them? So as an industry, we have to figure out certain hooks, certain ways in which we can get consumers excited about energy. And I believe the solution lies in data analytics. That's great. Jeremy, what do you have to say about it? Uh, I think one of the things that I would say is that when we think about smart meters, and we're talking about the amount of data and, and the utilities capabilities around dealing with that data. Just think about a, a, standard, a standard utility um, prior to a smart grid would read your meter at best once a month, usually not even that often, right? We're reading meters at worst once an hour, every single day. Um, in places where we actually have active demand response programs, where we are actually taking um, peak air plants off, offline, we're, um, we're saving investment dollars out of building coal plants in Oklahoma right now. Um, <clears throat> we, we're, we're measuring actually 3,000 times more um, per month than, than we would have if we were just having people walking around looking at meters. So it's a, it's a, it's a massive amount of data and it's not just about the data and the ability to to deal with it, but it's also about how the utility itself is, is organized. Utilities today are not built to, to handle this. Um, their processes, the software stacks, one of the things, when you start getting into this industry, you, you, you learn a few things really quickly. And one is that they manage meter data with these, with these systems called meter data management systems. Um, a meter data management system, when you bring in a smart meter uh, infrastructure, is a big data platform. But guess what? These things were not built initially to be big data platforms. Um, so th these are these are some of the challenges that, that we have to deal with. Now, what are we going to do with all this data, and what else is what else is going on other than just reading meters? Well, one of the things that we can do with this data is by analyzing it. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, I guess, is that when there's a power outage. Um, Generally, the utility doesn't know about this power outage until someone phones them up. Um, and generally, if no one's home or people are asleep, they don't have good data based on phone calls about wh where, where the power outages are. With a, smart, with a smart grid network, you can actually pinpoint these things and make sure that you're getting the right people out there uh, with the right equipment to go fix these problems um, in much, much faster time. And this, in some cases, actually saves lives. Um, that's the that's you know the best case. The other thing is we're starting to see plug-in cars, right? When you plug in a car, and um, we all know that if you if if uh, if Victor gets a gets a uh, pluggable hybrid or, or an electric vehicle, I'm more likely if I'm his neighbor to get one as well, right? Well, when you plug too many of these things in on one street, you start destroying the the um, transmission infrastructure. Um, the distribution infrastructure part. Um, so we're also using this data to model that to make sure that, that the infrastructure, the actual electric grid is going to be able to handle the, the electric vehicles that we're going to be putting out here and everything in between. So um, there's a lot that we're going to do with this data. Victor, uh, I would like you to add on beyond the clean tech and the clean energy. The data is coming not only from the energy consumption, there could be the water problem, water crisis. So the data is becoming humongous, not only in energy, but other areas as well. Would you like to touch base on that point as well, apart from the clean tech, you apart mean, from energy? Data outside of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although I was going to make the point inside energy just real quick, though. That, that this is right, but we have to realize that this is early days. We're used to our iPhones and all kinds of data, and you go to Amazon and they they can figure out and know what ads to serve up to you based on what you've looked at in the past. And we're, we're pretty accustomed to huge amounts of data being at, crunched and then used to serve up things to us in our life. The utilities are, are coming at this from ground zero. They, they have no data, as was pointed out. You know, they're going from one physical read of the meter a month to you know, 
feeds that are every 15 minutes, and they could be every minute. They just even every 15 minutes is just too much for them. They don't, they don't. It just falls on the floor. They don't know what to do with it. And so it's still very early days as far as in the energy sector how the data gets used. And if you look back in other industries and even in the energy industry, really the data first goes towards operational efficiency, trying to figure out how to use existing assets in a better way. Um, and, and in previous industry that was the case, and once that gets settled and gets figured out, then it starts getting applied to other applications where you can expand markets or provide additional services. But, but we're just beginning in the days of figuring out how to improve efficiency. Um, you know, whether, whether it's data in improving, knowing where in your transmission network the power line went down, because as pointed out, they know that by where the phone calls stop. And they, they get a rough idea. You know, we don't even have that fundamental infrastructure to create the data that, that is really the first step. Um, and so maybe that's why you're asking about other, other industries and where uh, data gets played, but, but we see kind of a, a merging or an overlapping because the infrastructure really isn't there in the energy sector. So how do you just kind of jump over that, whether it's consumer devices that bring data a little bit like Bidgley where you, you know, they can get some amount of data and they, they can mine that and provide value to consumers or companies, we have a company in our portfolio that um, if you put in a smart thermostat and provided a gateway on your own broadband because there's not a, not a utility network for it to go out on, although one day that'll be the case, it can provide data and it can provide you the comfort. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to even know that there's a lot of data being sent out and then returned back to your home and controlling for the comfort that you want and optimizing for the, for the efficiency of your home in order to save energy for the utility but provide the consumer you know, some value. And, and as we go forward, you know, what we are seeing is more technologies being adopted from the consumer side that you know, buries the, the data in the background and, and provides services to consumers. So, um, you know, uh, clean tech is, uh, is great. I mean, you know, uh, these three guys have already talked about uh, utilities and meter data ma management and so on. I wanted to broaden the topic because energy innovation is so big. It's so much beyond clean tech, which is very, um, or, or even utilities, or even our, just our electricity consumption at home. So I wanted to motivate those by personal examples. I started my career as a mining engineer. And for my master's thesis, I actually wrote the first software product. It's called Millsoft now, and it's used by several mining companies. This was in 96 and 97 to visualize and optimize mining operations. But the biggest challenges I had at that time was one, it was a research kind of project, so it ran, ran on a cray machine, which I, I don't even know if you guys know, some of you probably never saw a cray, but it ran on a cray machine. It, there was no way to tune the software because there were no sensors in the mining industry to feed back, and unless you're predictive, your model is useless. I mean, I could go retrofit anything, including the market crash, but it doesn't mean anything. So there was no sensor technology, and then there was no real-time feedback for control so that you could tune the operation to optimize use. And I wanted to throw out some numbers here. Uh, uh, Gopal threw out some, but let me tell you some of the things I, I, I keep track of. The mining sector alone consumes 9 billion, 9 billion kilowatt hours a year, 9 billion. A study done by several mining companies shows that they are 50% inefficient. You could cut this energy spent by 50%. That is already a cleaner planet. I can assure you of that. If you look at demand response, it's projected to be about an $8 billion market in the next five to seven years. If you look at home retrofits, that's about $35 billion today, and energy analytics plays a big role in that market. If you look at energy efficiency, that's a significant <coughs> market. So the, the, the point I want to make to entrepreneurs first is don't worry about the market. The markets here are so big if you can monetize even a fraction of that market meaningfully, everybody can make money. So that's really not a barrier here in the energy space. Let me give you two examples because in Silicon Valley you hear three words, right, when it comes to data. One is volume of data, 
the other is velocity of data, and the third is variety of data. And sometimes people think that for a successful ap application, you've got to have all three going for you along with analytics. And here is where two examples show you the difference. The first one I already mentioned is if you want to optimize mining operations, for example, you would need volume, you would need velocity, and then you would al you also get variety because a mining operation involves several steps. There are chemical processes, there are crushing processes, all of these consume energy, and you need feedback from uh, all three, and, and you need to optimize on the fly. So it requires all three. But I'll give you another example, because once I switched out of mining, I actually worked in electrical engineering, designing smartphone chips at Texas Instruments, and one of the chips that we brought to market was used in medical imaging. And what I found very interesting is some smart guys decided to use the same algorithms we developed for image enhancement to actually look at seismic data of oil fields from the 60s and 70s and re-image it to produce 3D images. And, uh, and what they found is there's enough oil to be extracted even in wells that have been shut down. So they are just going and revisiting old data, but new analytics. So here, what you don't care about volume. What you're doing is you're looking at the same problem, but with a new lens that's powered by all the learning that we have and all the infrastructure we have in terms of software and, and so on. And there's a lot of value to be made to say that, hey, you're, uh, you need not have shut down a specific reservoir. You, you can get eight or 10 more percent of productivity out of it. That's real money. So with these two examples, what I wanted to move on to is the smart grid. So the smart grid, I think, is one of the last big systems that is not sensorized as yet. And as uh, all these people have talked about, that's only happening now. And uh, so there are large problems. This is a very aging infrastructure. Again, this, the grid is really aging. I found another interesting number, which uh, I wanted to throw, throw out. Transformers were built to have a life of 20 years. The US, which is a first world country, has transformers with an average life of 45 years. So, so you know what's coming now. You, you're going to have these blackouts. You need to have the ability to predict. You want to squeeze the last drop of uh, uh, efficiency possible out of this infrastructure. You want to distribute your automation so that you don't have problems as you did in India where one failure dominoes and, and gets 600 uh, million people without power. So you have all these challenges that, um, that can be solved and software is an integral part of that solution. So I, I really have a lot of hope for this uh, sector, although it's going through some tough times in the valley now. Thanks, Ramesh. So it's really insightful. Elsa? Yeah. Um, utility space, I, I'm not going to try to repeat um, what they've already said. What was interesting for me, I guess, as an, another sector is the commercial sector, because we also serve as customers in commercials like supermarkets, factories, schools, etc. And what was really interesting is I was work, working with uh, and I don't know, uh, with grocery supermarkets, supermarkets, grocery stores. Um, there are about 35,000 uh, supermarkets in America alone. And they're looking to save energy as well. And, um, you know, we've been providing hardware that allows them to start understanding how they use energy. And I was sitting there with, um, you know, these store managers as well as corporate. Uh, I was working with a supermarket, the largest supermarket in uh, Hong Kong, which manages about 400 stores across Hong Kong as well as supermarkets in, in the U.S. And what was interesting was they, they were like, I was showing them all the graphs and all the data, and now they can figure out which compressor is, um, you know, the compressors that they have in their refrigerators and how well they're doing, all this information, new information. They were like, Elsa, information overload, right? Um, but then he's just, you know, these managers and uh, operation people start looking at me and said, well, you know, I have all these salespeople from, you know, uh, carrier and train selling me these brand new smart energy systems, refrigerator systems. And, you know, we would install them and they, they would tell us in the tender process that it will be much more efficient, 10% guaranteed, right? But what happens when they buy those systems is nothing happens, right? But they don't understand that. They're just frustrated as business owners and operation managers of why that is, right? So having and being able to have access to that data 
Now it empowers them to hold their suppliers to be accountable to what they're marketing. And to me, that was really interesting in terms of what type of, you know, all that data that we're collecting for them, what it allows them to do to turn around and from a business side, start making those decisions. And also, you know, obviously they're also trying to do operation efficiency, right? Because they also don't want to buy brand new and the latest and greatest refrigerations. They want to basically have a refrigerator that's going to be there for 10, 20 years, basically until they break down and no longer be able to be fixed. Um, and so, you know, that's all that data um, is very interesting to them. And what I found is even electricians. Uh, and mechanicals and HVAC contractors. And these guys, you know, they're as non techy as possible, but they're really busy guys. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you ever try to hire an electrician. They're always like so busy, it's hard to get them. Um, and, and what we started saying is like, we wanted them to be partners to install our products and give the information to the owners. And uh, one of the things that we started sharing the data to them, uh, they were very responsive. They were like, wow. So instead of waiting for a panic call from my customer that a refrigerator or an air conditioning is down, I could know ahead of time that that machine is falling and I should schedule time to go there and see what's going on. So this whole pre-maintenance application of just getting access to the data, informing them in terms of servicing that appliance before um, it actually breaks down, that's a whole new market in terms of opportunity uh, for that even uh, for that market um, and so that is very exciting to me in terms of being able to use information to empower people to look at things totally differently and opportunities uh, for those people so when IBM does something it obviously has to be big um, inside a software group um, a typical program has to have an entry-level opportunity of 100 million just to get on the board um, big data certainly has opportunities that are much greater than that, and um, consequently, the information management business unit that we work in um, for years has been producing um, essentially the plumbing underneath the covers that runs your financial systems, IMS, if you're familiar with that, <coughs> E2 on the database side, other um, relational um, repositories. Those traditionally in enterprises represent about 20% of the data that's available to anybody. 80% um, of that in most enterprises today is unstructured and hasn't been exercised. Um, and that's where big data comes in. Big data is designed to tackle that remaining 80%. So if you look at a company like IBM or an Oracle or, or others um, in that space, you think they've built these billion dollar businesses off of 20% of the available data. And we're now growing exponentially the amount of data that can be um, gathered and stored and analyzed and processed inside of our systems going forward. So we view big data as a tremendous opportunity. Um, our general managers said more than once that this is once in a generational um, type of opportunity that comes together. So IBM's all in on big data. The areas that I'm involved with is we're building out platform technologies. All right, so if you're familiar with Hadoop and the Apache Open Source Committee, or community, excuse me, um, our product in that space is called Big Insights. And we're taking that to um, pretty much any industry, it's a horizontal opportunity, building out that platform and then putting specific applications on top of that. Um, one of the uh, referenceable accounts that we're allowed to talk about in one of our early adopters is a European company called Vestas, and they're in the, uh, the wind turbine industry. And as you would um, expect in that industry, um, when you're going to go place these capital assets in strategic locations, um, these towers can cost upwards of $20 million a piece you have to analyze very thoroughly what type of return you're going to get on that investment. All right? So when you're looking at just the weather data to support the installation of a farm of those um, wind turbines, you have to know with a high degree of certainty that you're going to make your money back over that 20 year period. Um, so they don't just look at average weather patterns over the course of a couple of months or years. They're looking at granular data down to that parcel in varying um, altitudes going up to the top of the pole at the bottom the different conditions that are coming in through the seasons, um, and then span that over years. Historically, when Vestas would try and analyze that data, it would take them upwards of three weeks to ask and answer questions, which when you're trying to plan for those capital investments is not exactly an efficient use of the company's time. Uh, once they deployed the infrastructure that IBM had developed, um, they were able to drive those questions down, in some cases, to 15 minutes. 
right? And that was because all of the data was online, in disk, in memory, ready to go. Um, so that's a complete game changer. When we look at the uh, ENU market as a whole, some of the opportunities we're seeing to answer the specific questions of how will this impact your life. Um, as other panelists have already said, um, utilities don't know how to manage their data, they don't know how to manage their non-electrical grid-based networks. Um, IBM and companies like IBM are coming in and helping to analyze um, that data and that new analysis is opening up a whole new opportunity in the form of competition and services coming out of the utility. So the biggest change I think we'll see from a residential point of view is these smart meters are installed and deployed and um, transmission lines are updated and sensors are added is you're, for the first time really ever you're going to have a competition at the utility level because you don't have to go with the grid anymore. You can produce your own power, you can sell it back onto the grid and in order to keep the customer we're not just rate payers anymore, right? We're, we're not somebody who's just a house number and it doesn't matter who's living in it, that bill's gonna get paid. But you have to retain us, you have to keep us happy, and you're gonna have to provide the level of service that's going to differentiate you in the marketplace. Essentially, free market forces are finally being introduced to the utility level. Then you have new creative um, applications that are coming out of that that are empowering us to have you know, itemized receipts, ways to properly manage uh, what we're doing but you're no longer locked into a single monopolistic choice. Um, and so IBM is you know, heavily involved in, in the energy sector. We're working closely with a lot of cities. We have some products that we call um, IOC, which is the Intelligent Operations Center. And that allows cities to deploy and monitor energy consumption, um, water utilization. Uh, we are even getting, in some cases, stadium management. So I, I'm sure the stadium going in and down the street here will have a lot of that type of intelligence in it as well. How can they better manage their uh, power consumption on any given uh, game day? So it's a, it's a fascinating new world, but uh, fundamentally we're looking at tackling the 80% uh, that hasn't been uh, managed over the, uh, over the last few decades. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, uh, guys. Uh, this was a great round on one, my first question, and we're going to pick up some speed over here, but this was great insight. What I learned, I learned a few new things over here. Uh, I was uh, thinking that it is only a uh, energy-centric uh, utilization of data, but what I also learned is that we could be using data in a much different way, as Alyssa was talking about and Ramesh was talking about. But that, if, if, we, if we take out that piece of uh, efficiency improvement and preventive management improvement, uh, there is uh, a contradiction here. The contradiction is we generate data in the internet shopping to change the behavior for consuming more. But what we are talking about over here is changing the behavior to consume less. And I sometimes find, and most of you might think about it, it's a contradiction. Why would utilities like you to consume less? And I think it might be a good idea to understand their point of view. Jeremy, why don't we start with you since you guys manage the huge fleet of data management for bg and &E, and then move on to Pratik who was talking about the lifestyle changes and then we want to move on to other matters. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I think the, the primary reason why, why utilities are, are all for this is that, first of all, it's, it, this, the technology doesn't start off disruptive, let's be honest. What we're doing is we're taking feet off the street and we're we're listening to the data over radio. And that's that's interesting, but it's just more efficient. It's not really disruptive. But what really ends up happening once you get all these all these sensors out there and you've got all this data is you, you actually start to enable some really, really interesting new business models. So first of all, a utility's ability to get into it, most utilities, by the way, are are um, you know, they're, they're for-profit, you know, investor-owned companies. So, you know, finding new ways to, to, get, to get money is good for them. The other thing is, it's not good for them to, to, um, to put a lot of money into more peaker plans. Um, for most people who don't understand what a peaker plan is, it's a, it's a small uh, generation, energy generation facility that usually runs off oil. Um, one of the problems with with the bigger plant is if your if your transmit or if your generation is, is short by one kilowatt hour, then you got you got to turn on a bigger plant or or you've got blackouts. 
Um, if you've got a 10 megawatt peaker plant, you're putting 10 megawatts on the wire and you don't get it back. It doesn't get stored anywhere. You burn that fuel, it's gone. So that's a really big reason why you're, you know, it's better to use less. Let's, let's you know, use what we have efficiently. Um, that plus, you know, some really innovative new business models that we'll see happening over the next 10, 20 years. Um, I, I think we won't recognize the utility industry that we have today once it's fully answered. What do you think, Lillian? So I'll add a couple of reasons to what uh, Jeremy mentioned. Uh, one, 27 of the states in the country have utilities which are either decoupled or have some lost revenue mechanism. Decoupled means your revenues are not directly proportional to sales. California is one such state. You do not generate more money by selling more electricity, so incentives are automatically aligned. Secondly, if you do not have decoupled, there are about 15 states who have lost revenue mechanism. They can go back to the Public Utility Commission and say, hey, we lost so much revenue because we were doing energy efficiency. Public Utility Commission, in most cases, come back and give them the money and also give them incentives. Perfect incentive alignment. Let me throw out another reason. Transmission congestion. So if your uh, electricity consumption goes up, what do utilities do? They have to build power plants, which are expensive. That translates to higher rates. But on top of that, you need to ensure that you have transmission interconnection. 